Hi, everyone. So we're going to go ahead and get started. I know that Harry may be a few minutes late because he was coming from another meeting. Um, so we're going to start um, with uh, Mazhir Shadman. Um, he is going to be talking about an update on some of the CLL trials. Good morning. Uh, what a great start for the leukemia meeting, starting with CLL. Um, uh, so what I'm uh, hoping to do today to give you a quick update on um, CLL trials that uh, SWAG, ECOG, and Alliance have been running, and also the, well, I don't have much to say on the upcoming studies, but um, I have one slide. So just very quickly, um, before we get to the studies, the current treatment landscape for CLL which is changing very quickly every few months now. Uh, the current standard of care for patients who don't meet the criteria for treatment remains to be watch and wait. And uh, as I will show um, in, in, in a few minutes in our SWOG study, we are trying to see if that should be the case uh, for patients with high risk disease. For patients who need treatment, now we, are, uh, uh, we have entered the chemo free era and either venetoclax-based therapy or BTK inhibitors are used in the frontline setting. With recent data, there is more, um, uh, the, more data indicating that second-generation BTK inhibitors should be used. Anabrutinib is not approved for CLL at the moment, but it's part of the NCCN guidelines, and a, a, an approval is expected. And the second line, depending on the first-line setting, uh, the other class could be used. In patients with abnormal P53 mutation, there is um, most agree that BTK inhibitors should be the treatment of choice. And in the relapse setting, we still have PI3 kinase inhibitors. It may change at least one of the drugs. And it is expected to have some maybe new additions to our treatment landscape uh, uh, in, in near future. Um, so with, with that background, um, I'll start with the SWOG 1925 study. Dr. Debbie Stevens couldn't make it to the meeting. And this is the EVOLVE trial. And the idea here is to see if the current standard of care of watch and wait for patients who don't meet the classic indication criteria for CLL remains to be a reasonable approach in the era of novel agents. With chemotherapy regimens, we uh, were not able to show that early intervention is beneficial to the patients. But the question came back when we entered the novel agents era. One study, at least with ibrutinib, only showed event-free survival, at least with the current follow-up. But the SWAG study is trying to see if venetoclax and obinutizumab combination would be a reasonable treatment for early interventions in patients with high-risk disease. The way high-risk disease is defined is using the CLL IPI or CLEPI score. And I will have a slide to show the details of the scoring system. Basically, patients who have a score of four or more defined as high-risk or very high-risk CLL or if they have complex cytogenetics, they're randomized in a 2 to one fashion to have early intervention with venetoclax and obinutuzumab with a standard regimen, or they will wait until they meet the criteria for treatment, and then they will receive the same treatment of venetoclax and obinutuzumab. The primary endpoint of the study is what it should be for an early intervention study and its overall survival, which also means that this study will take a while for us to have the primary results of. And there are some secondary endpoints, basically standard secondary endpoints and some translational endpoints that will be um, assessed as uh, part of the uh, analysis. So uh, patients need to be within 12 months of their diagnosis. The reason for this uh, criteria is the fact that you can have a patient with high-risk disease, but if, you're, if they're doing well for seven years, then their disease is probably not very high-risk. So trying to really um, um, exclude patients who, despite the high-risk cytogenetic or molecular features, are still doing well clinically. And of course, they should not, by definition, they should not meet the criteria for treatment and no prior treatments. And the, the IPI score, the CLL IPI score is uh, shown here in the table. It's a combination of molecular, cytogenetic, and clinical features. So in patients who have a P53 mutation or deletion, they meet the criteria just by that, because they get four from that. But a quick, uh, basically, reminder to the group that 
a patient who's older than 65 and they have an unmutated IGHV mutational status and a rise stage of uh, one, they would also meet the criteria for high-risk disease. So this is not just limited to patients with an aberrant P53 gene. So it's important for us to take care of these patients to look at all the clinical and uh, molecular features of the CLEP score. Um, just uh, these are some points that Dr. Stevens wanted to make sure that we, uh, like from her experience, basically uh, emphasizes on the, uh, on the fact that patients with high risk disease now have, on this clinical trial, an option of receiving treatment. Most of us, uh, the, the issue having a patient in front of us with new diagnosis, uh, especially with high risk features, is to convince them not to receive treatment. A lot of times the conversation, the question they ask us, how, can, how come you're not treating my high risk leukemia? So. For, for many patients with high-risk disease, I, I don't find it difficult to really present this study and I think should, be, um, should not be a difficult task. Just a quick reminder that venetoclax and obinutuzumab are provided in both arms by this study, and that's another important practical point. So the study is open since December of 2020 and is also now active in Canada. The current accrual is uh, 39 out of the planned 247 patients, 247 patients, and you see the top accruing sites, and there are more that are joining, including us. We're very, very excited to have uh, patients. This is a study that we have been talking to patients about, and there are many who are interested in waiting for the study to be open. Moving on to the next study, this was uh, ECOG study, E9161, a randomized phase three study that targeted patients with active disease in the frontline setting, patients who had indication for treatment, young, younger than 70, and this study specifically excluded patients with DEL17P. Patients got randomized after stratification by the factors you see their age, performance status, stage, and presence of DEL11Q, and they either received ibrutinib and obinutuzumab, with ibrutinib going indefinitely, or a combination of ibrutinib and obinutuzumab plus venetoclax from cycles 3 to 14 with a primary endpoint of PFS. There was no MRD assessment or MID-guided uh, uh, therapy with this clinical trial. So the study, uh, finished enrollment and reached a goal uh, actually earlier last year. So 720 was a very rapidly enrolling study and we're, we'll be waiting for the uh, readout at some point. Um, so that, that was our frontline younger patients study. And then we had the alliances study with a relatively similar, similar uh, design, uh, another phase three randomized this one in patients older than 70, uh, and randomization was based, uh, this, for this study, patients with DEL17P were included, and randomization was again between ibrutinib and obinutuzumab. Regardless of their MRD status, they would continue ibrutinib uh, indefinitely, and patients who were randomized to ibrutinib, obinutuzumab, and venetoclax, similar to the other study, for this arm, uh, we would, uh, there was an assessment of MRD status and patients who had detectable MRD would continue ibrutinib and those who had undetectable MRD would discontinue ibrutinib. So this study's enrollment was a little bit slower than the other one, but it finished enrollment in June of this year. So reached a target of 464. And you see that uh, the number of patients that were enrolled in Alliance SWAG and ECOG and NRG are listed there. So basically, currently both uh, uh, intergroup studies for frontline CLL are closed, meaning that uh, the two groups and uh, are working on their upcoming frontline studies. And at SWAG, we are actively working on a concept for relapse refractory setting. Uh, last week, I reached out to Dr. Brown and Dr. Parikh, who will be leading the ECOG and Alliance studies, um, and they don't have anything to share at this point. Uh, I, all I can say is that they're working on frontline studies using novel agents. We, I was hoping to give you some update on the relapse refractory concept. Unfortunately, we have not been able to get any meaningful confirmation from uh, um, the parties that we've been talking to companies. So uh, it's it's an ongoing discussion, which, um, uh, but it would be a combination therapy 
uh, with novel agents in the relapse setting. So hopefully we'll be able to provide updates in the future meetings or in our uh, discussions internally in the future. I would be happy to answer any questions on CLL or CLL studies. Do you know when um, the study should read out? Do you have any idea just of estimate for the front line? Uh, Eli, Eli, I don't know, no. It's, uh, yeah, I mean, the e has been closed now for, for a while, so, uh, but Alliance, as uh, Dr. Wyack has specifically mentioned that she has no idea when. Okay. Do you want to say a, a word about what you think the challenges are in developing a study in the relapse refractory setting? Yeah, so uh, the biggest challenge is the fact that um, a few things. So many patients in the fr frontline setting these days are exposed to either BTK inhibitors, at least first generation and second generation, and or venetoclax. And uh, to design a study that of course, doesn't use chemotherapy, we are left with very limited options. So if you go by first or second generation BTK inhibitors, we have to exclude a big proportion of patients who are previously exposed to these drugs. And also for venetoclax, we would need to define a period that we don't want to include patients who relapse immediately after stopping venetoclax or on it. So we need a third class of drugs that could be used in patients who are exposed to both families of BTK inhibitors, at least first and second generation, and venetoclax. And options are limited at this at the moment. PI3 kinase inhibitors are not the most attractive option these days, and uh, for safety reasons, it's not our uh, interest to to use them probably, unless maybe at some point they come up with a different schedule and different dosing and that are safely uh, administered. And then other classes are either not approved, and, uh, but we are actively discussing with uh, some um, companies that are making some novel classes that could be used in that setting. And I know your working group also uh, was considering uh, interventions for Richter's transformation. Yeah, so Richter's transformation is another, was another uh, interest and still is. I mean, it may be not as an intergroup and large study. The challenges with Richter's are, are many. Um, um, and I will, first of all, to have a patient with Richter's diagnosis on a clinical trial, it means that you have to capture them in the right place and perfect timing because they're either uh, at the CLL phase or they're too sick to get on a study. And then there are many competing studies, all the phase one, two novel agent studies that are looking at BNHLs, they do include hot, uh, Richter's transformation. So many sites have many competing trials. But I still think you know, that's an unmet need, and it would be uh, we're definitely interested in looking at some options, you know, either first line for Richter's or, or relapsed. And um, yeah, that, that, that has been the discussion, as you know, that we've been having. Uh, it's definitely an unmet need. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. I'll just say uh, so, Deb Stevens uh, uh, has. Um, is the uh, kind of the uh, chair of that CLL uh, working group. And really, I appreciate um, all the hard work you guys are putting into, you know, considering, you know, the next steps um, to keep SWAG in the CLL game. Appreciate it. So next, uh, Jerry is going to talk a little bit about Match and also um, some updates on CML. Good morning, everyone. Um, so let's see what we've got here. Uh, excellent. So first thing I'm going to do is basically um, get everyone up to speed on the one study that we have in CML. This is actually Kendra's study, but she can't be here. And then talk a little bit about translational science that we might apply to it since we're all here and that's what I do. Um, so this is uh, her study, 1712, a randomized phase two trial of TKIs plus RUX in the C, uh, chronic phase CML. And this is um, brought from inf um, data from her um, site and others uh, showing that um, the JAK stat pathway may be involved in, in many patients with CML and may cooperate with BCRABLE. So there's some rationale, especially in people who aren't responding well to TKIs to, to add a RUX inhibitor to try to completely black out that pathway. 
And so this was a study, you could be on virtually any TKI, you had to be on it for over a year and have a response of at least a, a complete cytogenetic remission. And the idea is if you give RUX, can you push these people down to a deeper response um, with the primary endpoint of MR 4.5 at 12 months? That's important because that's the level that if you maintain for a while is associated with being able to discontinue TKIs in the future with about half patients uh, who achieve a 4.5 log reduction being able to stay off TKIs after a discontinuation. And if, then the, basically the uh, follow-up is going to be for another 12 months and then onward down to five years. The status report now is that the plan to enrollment, uh, when she wrote this slide, was 77, but they just finished, it was 78th, so this trial was completely enrolled. Um, so well, there wasn't money to do anything interesting on all, all the PCR was done uh, locally. So the idea is now that we have all these samples and sequential samples, what fun and interesting stuff can we do with them? Um, and so if we can find some money by um, through SWAG or NCI or, or maybe a bake sale or two, um, this is some of the stuff we can we can propose. And I haven't shown this stuff before, but it's kind of interesting and this would be a good group of uh, patients to study this on. So what we're going to be doing is, uh, and I'll show you the gene expression and the spot stuff and some of the digital PCR work that might be important in using on these patients. Yeah, so before, the, you, before you go on, yes, how much are we talking? Money? Yeah, for to do those studies. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, we got enough how, 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 how much you got? <laughs> um, well, I heard the Hope Foundation is, um, is so uh, but, 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 um, seventy some eighty patients. Uh, you could probably do it for hundred thousand dollars. Sounds like we should go to the Hope yeah. Foundation for yeah. for this. Yeah. Okay. But more importantly, I'll put my wallet away. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You don't. Yeah. You, don't <laughs> you don't bring up money to a sequencer, okay? Um, so um, let's talk about about why you would want to do this. Okay. So. One of the things that, that we're always very interested in is why do people respond well and why do they, people respond poorly? And so in, in our lab, we approach this by looking at outliers, um, take the best responders, take the worst responders, do your genetics on those, because if you don't find a biological signal in those two groups, you'll never find it in everything else. And so what we've done here is looking at patients who get either a poor response to tyrosine kinases or get a great response. And then those were defined by the criteria shown in the good and poor responders there. And these were from patients from the ENIS and D trial, which was a randomization between nilotinib and imantinib. And the first thing you see is that um, the red are the poor responders and the blue are the good responders, that when you make these criteria by the, by the six and 12 month mark, those glide paths are maintained for up to 10 years. So you can really see, you don't see very much mixing of those blue and red signals at all over time, which means your kind of your genetic destiny is, is pretty sighted early on. And so the first thing we did was RNA-seq. This was all done on diagnostic samples before they get a whiff of a TKI. And we ask, what predicts um, overall response? And if you look at gene expression, you look at differential gene expression, you find that the uh, area under the curve there is about 0.8, roughly. Um, if you look at the clinical variables that we look at, that we think, you know, so-called score, all this stuff that people use, it's basically a flip of the coin. And if you add clinical data to gene expression, it doesn't really do anything at all. So gene expression global signature seems to, to decide which category you fall into. And then this is where it really gets fun. You can start looking at good responder genes and poor responder genes. And if you look at the good responder genes at diagnosis, all the top 10, which are on the left, those are all associated with the immune response. So the, prior to starting therapy, people who respond well have, a, have their immune system jacked up. Poor responders are associated with basically overexpression of metabolism genes and cell cycles, which makes some sense, right? And then this is a pathway analysis, and this is kind of hard to see, but gene enrichment pathway. But um, the p-values on the top ones are like 10 to the, the y-axis, or the, uh, I mean, on the bottom is um, the p-value. So you can see the top pathway is p minus 100 and something. So it's probably significant. Um, and so of the 20 pathways that are involved, pathways, all 20 of them are involved in the immune system which to me is kind of mind boggling that, that so what, what it means is that, you know, we've always seen this 
dichotomous uh, curve when people get their obesity able goes down fast and goes slow. And there's all been sort of kind of hand waving stuff about cells coming in a cycle and not. But what this might be actually is that you have the people who are going to respond have their immune system jacked up, but it's kind of like wildebeest and, and lions, right? If the wildebeest proliferate fast enough, the lions can't eat anything. And so the tyrus and kinases start killing off the wildebeest until you get to a point where the immune system can mop up. So you have the initial killing of the TKI and then kind of the mop up in the good responders. And this is kind of showing a regulatory network. So what we can do is you can take those gene expression signatures and then you can look at, at um, transcription factors that are deregulated between the two. And then you can look at the genes that are involved in those uh, transcription factors. These are called regulons. And when you do that, you can, you can make people through a network there about passing tests by certain regulons in expression. And you get to a point where you're, you can get to an odds ratio of predicting good responders and bad responders of about 10 which is a pretty good odd ratio in this kind of work. Um, all the gene regulators that are involved are, are, are again, immune response regulated, uh, interferons, uh, interferon alpha, et cetera. So I think that this, we're probably onto something about how we can, can look at this. And so this will be what we're, the work we're going to be doing is trying to see if we, the same kind of immune signature is captured um, at diagnosis in, in kind of samples. The other thing we want to do, because the idea will be eventually is to put these people on a discontinuation trial is to better predict who can be discontinued or not because you obviously don't want to discontinue someone if you know they're going to relapse because as soon as they're off tyrosine kinase their risk of potentially developing a accelerated phase of blast crisis is high since they're not exposed to a drug right and i have to remind everyone that cml is a really really weird thing as far as latent period um, the Japanese continue to follow Hiroshima and Nagasaki survivors. The last time they did about five years ago, there were still people who were exposed to that. There's still an excess of CML compared to controls, like 70 years after the exposure. So we do these discontinuation trials, and even people who aren't relapsing, we can't guarantee that without tyrosine kinase, they're developing a clone that's going to emerge five years or six years from now, 10 years from now, that's going to be blast crisis. So I think that, that, that all of these continuations are fraught with that possibility, right? So the idea is, what's, is, is there a better way in people who have a low PCR or a negative PCR to predict which of those people are gonna relapse or not? And that might be an, an issue of just developing a better, better mousetrap. And so in PCR, you, you know, the, you're dealing with, like everything else in the world, um, signal to noise, right? And so it's really kind of amazing that PCR ever works because you're trying to, to, to target this specific molecule and you have backgrounds of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of other molecules, right? Um, and so there's a limit of that. And, and typical PCR is also, your inhibitors are involved. You make your whole calculation by the exponential expansion of your target gene versus the exponential expansion of your uh, control gene. And if those curves aren't the same, then your, your accuracy falls off depending on what your target level is. So a better way of doing this is a so-called digital PCR. And what that means is that you just take a PCR reaction and you dilute it into either wells, which is the top thing by uh, uh, fluidime, or into droplets, which is what BioRad and Kyogen does. Um, and if you dilute it to less than, on an average, one molecule per well and amplify up the signal, you'll get a yes or a no. And that's what digital means, yes, yes or no. Um, and then you can back calculate the original concentration uh, on the, with the, using the Poisson distribution. Um, and for those of you who are um, interested in the history of math, and, and frankly, who isn't, right? Um, the, the curve on the right um, is the first use of the distribution of the Poisson di um, distribution in, in the 1800s. It was used to describe deaths uh, by horse kick to Prussian military officers. And so if anyone ever gets called up in a game show and they get that right, you owe me half the money. <laughs> But this actually works. This is looking at the last trial, which was the, what, the largest US discontinuation trial, 174 patients. Um, and we took patients who were conventionally negative by PCR and then you did digital with them. And you find that you pick up um, a signal in more than half those patients. And you can see on the right here on those curves, um, if your regular PCR and digital PCR are undetectable, your risk of relapsing is very, very low. But if you're PCR undetectable, but digital detectable, your risk of relapsing is over 
So it may be a kind of a better mousetrap to de decide who's going to relapse and who's not. So we'll take this to this trial if we can, if Harry can find us the money. And I think that's all I'm going to do there. If anyone has any questions. Okay. And as Monty Python used to say, and now for something completely different. Um, you know, we've been talking about my woman match for quite a while here. And so what I was going to do is update people kind of where we are in the process. And then Cecilia will talk about where we are in the process of the lab component. So the first thing here, my life and my own match. Um, so <laughs> I, I'm with one of the co-directors of the laboratory section. Um, and so in the evolution of deciding how this is going to be done, how we're going to petitioning off samples to various places and the like, um, because it was a lot of money, the government financing uh, group called Lidos was involved in distributing the money. And so this is a very secretive process. I mean, it was, if they, would, they, they wouldn't say what criteria they're going to use to pick labs. Uh, when we had discussions, we couldn't name labs by name. You had to kind of like do gestures, you know, like lab, West Coast. You know, and, um, and, and they went away, and then they kind of mysteriously, you know, come with a clay tablet and drop it on in someone's lap about do they want the contract or not. Um, because I was so involved, um, I've accused ourselves from doing this because I thought that would be a conflict of interest. Um, alas, that didn't work, and they dropped the contract on us. Um, and so this is not um, the usual career arc that I thought I would be doing, is, is doing many government contracts, which is, a, is a, an art that I really don't recommend that anyone take up. Um, and then, um, because no one else could do, want to do it, I uh, was responsible for doing the master screening interview assessment protocol. And this quote, um, I think, is very valuable for many parts of our life. No good deed will go unpunished. Um, many people ascribe that to Oscar Wilde, although most historians who do that actually um, ascribe it to him about three decades after he actually died. So I think that's probably pretty unlikely. Um, but I know that it was actually in the treasure of Sierra Madre because that's where I heard it first. So that kind of describes what this, some of the stuff I'll be talking about here. Just to remind everyone, the general principles of MyoMatch, it's going to be a genetic-driven protocol assignments by cytogenetics and mutations. They're predominantly phase two uh, trials with predominantly MRD endpoints, first by flow cytometry and later maybe by some other technology, which I'll describe a little bit. And this is sort of kind of what the master screening reassessment protocols will do. Um, and these are the primary and secondary objectives that Megan uh, filled out. And the idea on the right is uh, you get enrolled, uh, we do rapid genetic testing within two to three days. Um, if there are a marker for your particular mutations, if it's, it's FLT3 mutation, you would go on a TKI trial. Um, you would get reassessed throughout, or assessed, depending on what your language is, um, throughout the trial. And at the time of the end of the trial, if you, you know, have MRD possible, you would go to potential so-called eraser trials. If you're negative, you could be followed. And you'd be reassessed each time because, as you know, clonal heterogeneity like mutations come and go, and you, you basically have to get reassessed to see what things you'd line up for. Um, I'm happy to say that after a long process, this has been approved, at least in its current form. And what it does is it consents for pretreatment assays to be formed. It's sort of like a portal. Um, it consents people for treatment reassessment assays. Um, and provides again the portal for the MDNEC algorithm, which is basically going to be data will go into a black box that David Patton's figuring out and it will spit out what protocol you're going to go on. Um, it doesn't dictate when treatment specific assessments are performed because that's going to be dependent on what regimen you're on. Right, so the MDNEC can't possibly come up with all the different time points that the individual protocols have to specify. And here's the proposed menu of testing in integral or integrated phase. At diagnosis, we'll be getting cytogenetics, FISH, CTAG, flow cytometry, and uh, Cecilia will talk about the rapid um, molecular testing we can do. MDR assessment will be done by flow cytometry. Um, we will talk about duplex sequencing as possibly being the next step in this. And we'll be doing studies that are in integrated studies looking at clonal heterogeneity and single cell stuff. This kind of shows how the uh, samples are spirited away and sent to a few labs. Um, this is going to be done originally when we set this up, Brett, and probably one of the reasons Lidos picked us was that Brett was at 
the, the Fred Hutch, he's now moved on to children, so that's a little bit of a logistical issue. Um, we will be splitting the genetic testing with um, the Frederick's lab at the NCI. They'll work Monday to Thursday, we'll work the rest of the time because we work at the weekends and the government can't work the weekends. And then samples will be sent um, to Minfang for rapid side genetics. And this is kind of how you imagine, we've got multiple tiers on the left there. We've got um, an older bin, an MDS bin, a younger AML bin. You'll have multiple studies. You'll go through them, you'll get it reassessed. If you have positive flow, you'll be put on eraser R as trials. Um, at the end of that, you can get reassessed for either transplantation-driven trials or CAR-T trials. And then we'll talk about, at the end of that, doing um, duplex sequencing to look at specific mutations to kind of d d to try to do um, basically targeted therapy at MRD after all that. Now, this is something I try to get David Patton to, to do. Um, I don't know how successful I will be at that, but I can imagine that as people walk through the tiers, tiers and stuff, we're going to have to have some kind of nice system where you can get a snapshot of what all has gone on, right? And so I think this is, I've talked to people who code, this can be do, done. As you can imagine, you can see a screen, this would be your screenshot. You would have the calendar time and actual dates. You'd have for each assessment, a summary of what the results are. Those would be clickable. So when you click them, the actual report, full report would come out. Um, and then as you go to, for instance, to protocol one, uh, protocol X and tier one, you can click on that and get downloaded the whole protocol. So these will all be basically a summary of your voyage through the, all of these tiers. And uh, you could quickly expand on it to get more and more information. I think that the chance that they'll actually do this is like me flying. But anyway, I think it looks, I think it looks actually quite nice. Um, the methodology side of genetics will go to Min Fang, Flo, Mibret will do, um, Moko and, and we will do the, the next generation sequencing. So this is just an example of why we think MRD is an important thing to look at. Um, this is a meta-analysis looking at patients who are MDR positive and negative. I think the important thing to remember here is that while MDRD is, is very positive, it's not nearly good enough to be a surrogacy because what you want to do is pull those two curves apart, right? You've got really 40% of people who are MDR negative who, who, who nonetheless die, and you've got people who are positive that somehow don't. So we're trying to figure out what that is, and some of the study we're doing, doing my, which is looking at that. And I've shown this a little bit before, but I'll show it again because I think this is one of the more promising um, technologies. This is um, so-called duplex sequencing. So uh, on the left is, um, again, the problem of signal and noise. So what those are are sequential and increases of the signal to noise by uh, order of magnitude by tenfold. You can see as you get from Sanger sequencing, which has a sensitivity of 10%, you kind of give an image of a face, but as you get down to about one in a million, uh, you can actually see that it's actually Darwin. Um, on the right shows the problem with sequencing. So the problem with sequencing is that um, when you create libraries and the like, all these enzymes have errors. And that error rate defines how sensitive you can get. Um, this is especially fraught with um, sequencing that's done off of um, RNA, because you have to make cDNA and reverse transcriptase makes tons of errors. That's why retroviruses are so hard to get rid of in nature, right? The, the, the enzyme was selected by nature that way. It makes tons of errors. Um, and, and so, and in fact, in, when you do this, we look at pcr able sequencing. If you go off RNA, you make one error in about every 24 molecules. So enough that it's really meaningful. Um, so in the top right there, that this is looking at a patient with uh, BCR able. We know they have a mutation, and so if you look basically by standard sequencing and you look there carefully, it goes down to about one percent, and that's about the the lowest threshold you can get with standard sequencing because you make an error about one in a hundred, one in a thousand base pair calls. Um, but what duplex sequencing does, and it's like some similar error correction methods, it actually makes um, template off both strands. And so then your theoretical error goes from one to the minus three. If you will make the, only make a mutation call at the identical mutation and at a complementary base pair, right? your theoretical sensitivity is 10 to the minus three times 10 to the minus three times the interaction of the four base pairs, which gives you a theoretical sensitivity about one in 10 to the seventh. So below is looking at that same sequence with duplex sequencing, which shows the 359 mutation. It basically gets rid of all the noise. 
And this is a sample, uh, a study that we did with SWOG uh, samples, and Megan helped out with this. This is looking at patients where we had Brentwood's flow cytometry, which is going to be the, what we use in the myelomatch to begin with, and we did duplex sequencing on their, their CR standards. And the two by two table is the most thing to look at. Um, when I was a grad student in epidemiology, my mentor used to say that almost virtually all of life's experiences can be put in a two by two table. That's actually pretty true, actually, if you try it. Um, what you find there is that you get a concordance rate of being flow positive, MR, uh, duplex sequencing positive, or negative negative of roughly 70%, but about 25% are negative by flow, but positive by duplex sequencing. And of those discordant cases, 15 of them, nine of them relapsed. So it probably means something. And these are the, the there's various ways you can define um, positivity of, of, a, of a clone. Go down to the bottom and see what flow is. That's the flow positivity or negativity and the time to relapse and overall survival the odds ratio is about two and a half. That's that first curve I showed you, that's exactly what that showed in that giant meta-analysis. So that fits. You can see the best definition of, of positivity by mutations is the top one. There, the time to relapse odds ratio is seven and overall five, so about twice as good. So that looks pretty promising. And here are the curves. And you can, again, duplex sequencing looks pretty darn good. So we're now advancing this in another SWOG study to kind of validate it. But this will be the work that we're going to be doing kind of as myelomatch goes, a head-to-head -head competition with a lot of them, hoping that, we, that, in fact, it may replace flow very soon. So this is the update. MSRP is approved. Cecilia is going to talk about the Genexus testing, which has been a load of work, um, but I think we're there. Um, and the other thing that's important here is the foundation of the NIH has given us a fair amount of money to do a, um, a large amount of work in really sealing down MRD technologies and AML. We have 15 corporate partners, which is kind of remarkable, pharma and biotech. Um, and this is sort of how these, what we hope is that the work in the foundation of the NIH, when we find better technologies and the like, we'll move over to the AML myomatch. Um, and I'll leave you with this. Um, you know, we use this thing, precision medicine, uh, precision medicine, I mean, words should mean something. Precision medicine is a terrible term because what precision is, is what the do bottom left is. All the arrows are in one place, right? So they're not on target, but they're precise, right? So the byline of precision medicine could be, we're reproducibly wrong, because that would be what precision really is. And the quote from the bottom of John Maynard Keyes, I'd rather be vaguely right than precisely wrong. And this is just finally the... the <laughs> The work that's been done on protocol development very quickly. Actually, I, when I wrote that title, that's the slide that PowerPoint offered up to me. I was like psychic. Um, these are all the trials that we have in the works. Green are past, red is almost there. You know, black is in uh, kind of thought mode. So it's a ton of trials that are really kind of coming up. And I think we're guessing that at any steady state, we'll hit about 10, eight trials. Um, this is just the things that are going on in the younger basket group. In the tier one trials, we've got two trials uh, going. I'll just show a schema of that in a minute. Or you can just see it here. The, the high risk is seven and three CPX. That's kind of changing a little bit. I think we're adding one more RMR. And then we have one eraser trial pr uh, program. Now, for the effort of time, I won't go through this anymore. And that's uh, on the right is uh, Fred Hutch, where we're from. Thanks. <laughs> Questions before Cecilia shows you more data than you can imagine. Okay, good. More data. All right. So, uh, can, if you can load the slides for Cecilia Young. Okay, thank you. All right, so one of the first things that um, Jerry did teach me was uh, no good deed goes unpunished. 
Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to be talking uh, about the correlative sciences and the data that we have been doing for the validation of the next generation sequencing assay for MiloMatch, as well as some of the work that we'll be doing for the duplex sequencing. So these are the current trials that we have in our central lab for SWOG. And starting with the uh, slide that Jerry covered, and specifically, we're going to be talking in this first part about the um, myeloid assay. So this is, there we go. And the main difference and what's allowing us to be able to have this really rapid three-day turnaround time um, that's different from most next generation sequencing assay that's currently at most of your centers probably is that the platform that is being used is the Genexus instrument and that is based on ion torrent technology which is a hydrogen ion based um, displacement and with that that's a very sensitive um, pH meter essentially so it's different from Illumina technology which requires a cluster generation cycle uh, that that slows everything down and one of the downsides of this is that it also does increase the error rate a little bit and so it went through a very rigorous feasibility and testing um, um, time period between us and the MOOC laboratory which is what I'm going to cover today but the advantage of this system is that everything is in that one box and it's extremely fast so I'm not going to belabor um, the chemistry here, but it is quite, an, um, quite nice in that it does have RNA and DNA combined into the same reaction. The RNA goes through a reverse transcription step right before um, target amplification and the library preparation all in one reaction. And what happens is in the bottom here, and I, do I have a pointer? Oh, I don't have a pointer. Okay, so on the very bottom bar there, what you can see is that the library preparation time is about 11 hours, and it goes directly from there into templating and then sequencing. So all that happens over about 20 hours on the instrument. And at the same time, once it starts sequencing, which is the little light blue area, it can actually start analyzing the data right away. And so that's how we can do all of this in the same instrument. And as it's starting to analyze, my technologist can actually go in there and start doing their work. And so that allows us to really within 24 hours start getting in there and doing interpretation and variant um, inter reporting. And so the panel that you're seeing here is actually version two, which is an improved panel and a little bit expanded. The green um, genes that are listed both in the DNA and the RNA are the additions. You'll see that there are, in addition to the fusion on the RNA panels, there are a couple of expression genes here, which we actually have not validated at this point. And so that is um, upcoming things that we can actually utilize. So if there are treatments that can utilize expression, that can be added. So this currently we have validated for about 1600 DNA hotspots as well as 800 RNA fusions. Over all of these, this covers about 93% of AML hotspots in that occurs at about 3% frequency and 72 of variants that occurs about 1% frequency. So it's a fairly comprehensive, it's not everything, but it's a very comprehensive um, panel. So now I'm going to go into the what we have done for feasibility and setting quality thresholds and also the harmonization experiments. So this is not to scare you or anything. This is really just to tell you that there are going to be areas that we're not going to be able to diagnose based on the ion torrent. And these are primarily homopolymer regions and regions that we know um, are problematic for this platform, but there are very robust um, thresholds that we're setting to make sure that this is reproducible and solid in performance. So for feasibility and harmonization studies, this is performed with the NCI MOCA laboratory to make sure we both laboratories are doing the same thing and reporting similarly. This was performed over, uh, over a thousand samples have undergone this type of testing and um, our quality metrics passed over 98% on samples. 
Um, and you see here um, the blue dots and the red dots are uh, what the performance metrics on the two laboratories, and we were pretty spot on with each other, so pretty happy about that. And this is based off of version one data, and what this informed us was there were some low performing amplicons, and I do have to give kudos to Thermos because when we went back to them and said, hey, you have a bunch of low performing amplicons, they went back and they redid their chemistry, and so they fixed a lot of these areas in version two, so they're no longer low performing. And so with the version one, the sensitivity was already at 99% and specificity was at 100% at this time. Our limit of detection, um, we figured out, was less than 1% actually for single nucleotide variants, 3% in, for indels, and really fusions, we can go down to 20 read counts. So that's pretty good for our next generation sequencing assay, and we were pretty happy with this. Reproducibility between our laboratories were 99.4%. That's phenomenal in terms of performance. Um, and our concordance rates, and this was on a limited number of samples initially, was pretty good um, at 100%. So ongoing, one of the things that we were worried about specifically for FLIT3 ITD. Now, um, our MO laboratory has been doing this for over 20 years. This ha we've been doing this before Jerry brought me on board as medical director. And we went back. Um, the reason why we were worried about ITD is, as many of you know, they go beyond 300 base pairs. And next generation sequencing has an amplicon size limit of about 120 base pairs in most platforms. And so we were worried that we weren't able to detect all of the ITDs. We went back into our archives and really did a, an assessment of how big and how many we might be missing. And so over about 401 um, cases from our archives, about 6% ended up being large, really big. And so we really try to challenge the system. We really tried to break the, the thermal assay. And so we took 69 samples. Um, these ranged in size from three to 350 one base pairs. They had multiple ITT peaks because that was the other thing we were worried about that it wasn't able, the assay wasn't able to detect everything. And also allelic ratios from super low down at 0 0.0007 all the way up high to see if you know we could essentially really break the assay. And this was done over 19 runs. And actually um, it did miss three calls. These are all the super low ones below um, our threshold of call, which is okay. And then it was not able to detect ITDs that were beyond 117 base pair. So that does tell us that we are going to be missing some of the larger ITDs. Um, the detectable range we had um, determined was around 21 to 117 base pairs based off, off of this study. However, there is a cell line, uh, PL21, that we've been re repeatedly able to detect that has an ITD at a 126. So we're setting our threshold for the assay at about 126 base pairs. So that is one limitation of the assay that we discovered on the feasibility studies. The ITDs we can detect is only up to about 120 base pairs. Um, so then we moved into the validation studies next. And so in validating the assay, um, a summary of the quality uh, metrics, you know, we only had three samples really fail. However, one of the samples ended up being our positive control that we run with every single run. We ended up having to fail the entire run and repeating that. These end up being internal issues with the instrument, which Thermo worked with us and, you know, ended up um, fixing that. So there's a small chance of failure on the samples, but I think we should be okay. So um, the next thing that would be important to you is what we use to validate the assay. And here, you know, just demonstrating that we did um, do a very thorough job of validating on samples that would recapitulate what um, AMLs would be coming through. And so we used a very um, big and robust thorough validation set, um, 84 samples for sensitivity and 33 samples for specificity. And these comprise both patient samples as well as cell lines and commercial samples. The fusion genes um, are represented here and they include the breadth of the different fusion genes we expect to see. And then the variants that are covered will include a lot of the trials that Jerry has mentioned already, um, and including a number of other AMLs that we expect to see. 
And so a very wide range of mutations that we expect to see. And so this is pretty preliminary data, but the overall sensitivity um, in a nutshell is 99.5. I did a blow up of the um, variants that are less than 5%, but then that's the reason really why we're setting the variant threshold at 5% for calling is because once you get below 5%, you do have um, a little wobble there. It's no longer a nice straight line where you see um, a change, but we will actually set the threshold for filtering at 2.5 so i'll be able to see mutations below 5% so you may get a comment that when I see a variant coming up below 5% and it's there, I might put it in the comment both DJ and I have discussed this that we may mention mutations coming up below 5% but we may not put it on the diagnostic line. For specificity, these are on the 33, um, and I put normal in quotation marks as, you know, nothing's ever truly normal in our in our group, right? Um, and so that came up on in six samples, seven detectable variants. These were orthogonally confirmed in both of our um, laboratories. We both detected it, and these we determined were either variants of uncertain significance. So really, we don't know um, what it is. They're not pathogenic or likely even oncogenic. And so these were either chip clones or VUSs, and these are considered true positives, but really what their significance in their biology is uncertain, and these were um, considered 100% specific at this point. And for reproducibility data, um, for the SNV and indels, I'm pretty happy with this. With the fusion reads, there is one uh, fusion which has a little wobble in it where we're keeping a close eye. However, it's well above the 20,000 threshold for call. So it would be, um, all of these would be a yes. It is, there, the fusion is present. It's just the read count is a little wobbly. And for terms of the data analysis, informatic and limbs, this is where we're at now at the validation. We're pretty much done with the wet bench validation. The data analysis, informatics and limbs, we just finished our bridging study. And that looks pretty good, except for a few TP53 VUSs that popped out. Um, but we, we see it, we can compensate for that. And then the rest of it is really working with uh, Matchbox and MDNet on getting our limbs and, and things like that worked out. And so our validation um, at this point is, is really the computer and bioinformatics, although that is going to be a ton of work in the next couple of months. And so our conclusion, we're making great progress on the assay validation. Um, it has good sense, this assay has great sensitivity and specificity. It's very reproducible between the two laboratories. Our limit of detection is going to be set at 5%, although we can see things down to about 2.5%. We have a few blacklisted regions and then also some regions that will require a higher threshold um, um, to be set. And then a little bit more work is ongoing with the informatics and the data analysis section. And then this last portion I'm going to be talking about is um, the uh, duplex sequencing and the twin strand assay. For this, we are actually going to be, um, the molecular oncology laboratory is uh, going to be involved as the backup laboratory. And a little bit about the technology, duplex sequencing eliminates technical noise, and that's how it's able to get the um, error rates really low. So in this system, it's tagging basically both strands of the DNA. And in doing that, it's able to say if the mutation isn't seen on both strands of the DNA, you can basically cancel out anything that is popping up. And you get down to an uh, error correction factor of 1 in 10 million. And in doing that, you are then able to actually say what is a true mutation. And so the duplex sequencing workflow, unlike um, the Genexis assay, is going to take a bare minimum of about five days, and we're projecting about seven days to get the report out. And this is kind of what we're projecting for workflow, about three days to do the library preparation, and then another two days just to do the Illumina sequencing reaction, which is typical. And then also after that is data analysis, which we're projecting actually two days to do data analysis and reporting. And this is their AML 29 panel, um, which has a lot of the markers, which is actually all of the markers that Jerry has shown in his presentation for the first four trials that they're, they're looking at. Um, working. And so this is their AML 29 version one. I know they're working on a version two, which includes the new ELN panel and guidelines. 
And so this incorporates um, a number of um, region of interest that are included in all of these genes and includes the hotspots that we will be uh, we will want to target. So the target input on this, it will depend on what type of assay uh, we are looking for. For MRD, this is really interesting for these assays because your input can go anywhere from 50 micrograms to two micrograms. And the purpose that you're trying to do this is actually um, will determine how much input you want and the reason why I say that is at diagnostic time point you really don't need that much input um, 500 nanogram is actually quite enough to really get a breath of what you expect to see in there however at MRD you really want to put more in there so at about 1.5 microgram for instance, you get about a 30,000 read depth. And so you, that's kind of the consideration that we're thinking about right now is how much sequencing do you need to get to the MRD depth that we actually want? And so those are the considerations for this assay that we have to determine. And so the performance characteristics, and this is where, you know, the, um, the balance between what type of VAF you want to detect, and this is three times 10 to the fifth where we're really now down to a very different scale. We're no longer at 5% or 2.5%. We're down to 0 0.003. We're really down to MRD levels, where if you want to get 100% predictive power down to these very low levels, you have to really think about how much input you want. And so it's a lot um, more. Um, so we're thinking about, say, for flow cytometry, and you know, I, I was working with Brent for many number of years, it's really how much you put in, right? For same thing for flow cytometry, if you want a very good MRD assay, you have to put in 100,000 cells, 500,000 cells to really get that interrogation power. And so um, on the bottom is, is really a simple linear regression looking at the correlation of hotspots. This is 27 key AML mutations. It's a pretty good correlation, and these are down at very low numbers. And so this is breaking this down further by single nucleotide variants, by indels, by FLT3 ITD specifically, and NPM1 at a very, very low level. And it's, it's um, pretty solid um, at the linear scale. This is feasibility data. We haven't gone through full validation yet, though. And that is what's planned next for harmonization efforts. The molecular oncology lab will serve as a backup for the Twin Strands CLIA lab. Um, our technician will be trained by Twin Strands um, CLIA laboratory technicians the harmonization plan we will we will actually have to establish filtration parameters as well as thresholds um, we will need to establish actually a sample exchange and proficiency testing program and we're planning to do this every six months to ensure that we have maintained um, concordance and then also for the assay validation, we actually will have to actually to do two assays. One is the diagnostic assay that will have a higher VAF, and then also an MRD assay that has a lower VAF. And there are specific considerations here for whether or not we are going to use VOSs or not. Um, and you know, the, one of the things for MRD consideration is what clones are you going to follow? And I think that's a conversation that um, uh, we still need to have and also the what the filtration parameters are and then for specificity these will of course be conducted on healthy patients but we still have to consider what are we going to do about chip mutations and and how to identify and exclude those in our filtration parameters so the conclusion here for duplexic sequencing would be a very good platform as you saw in jerry's data a um, couple of things we still need to build here are the proficiency uh, program and building standards and controls around this alternative approaches include digital pcr quantitative nested pcr and digital droplet pcr which um, jerry has gone through um, previously and also the harmonization and validation plans are in place and uh, will be done in the next uh, hopefully year or so and I wanted to thank uh, Jerry and our laboratories, also the SWOG team um, committee, and then also NCI and the DJ and the MOCA team. <laughs> Any questions? That's amazing. I mean, without the work that you've done, MiloMatch wouldn't even be possible. Um, so thank you for being punished by us. Um, <laughs> But you were you were up to it with Megan's help and and uh, Anna's and stats and it's just amazing. I, I have a question. You know, one thing that often comes up um, on on my patients is you, you know at baseline they have a certain variant um, present, 
and then you do a next gen panel afterwards and it does it can't get reported but the pathologist says but if i look for it i could find it do you take that into account in your reporting how do you and how do you do that and is it different for different mutations like single nucleotide variants versus in in insertions and deletions yeah so that's a really good question that's um why we go through this whole like validation and we call those deep dives so in our filtration parameters um when we validate our bioinformatics um you know pipeline we actually have set and lock down so that qaqc slide where i show all those numbers and the thresholds mm -hmm. we lock down our computer program and it performs the same way every time now what your pathologist does is they probably go in and do a deep dive they take off all the filtration parameters and say yeah. oh it's in there but it doesn't make it through that lockdown criteria so we're not supposed to report it mm -hmm. um, and so that's one of the challenges if you want a reproducible assay is you're supposed to lock it down and not report anything that doesn't make it through um, but you do see it in there and so that's that's kind of you know you're damned if you do you're damned if you don't right, right. <laughs> and so you know in trying to make it robust and reproducible every single time you do end up doing that and so i oftentimes when i do do it um you know it depends on your your laboratory's sop if you write it in there that if you've seen a past variant and you're supposed to go in and do a deep dive some pathologists will actually write it in the comment yeah. that it's there but it's at super super low right. levels and that's what we get as well. Mm -hmm. Cecilia, right. that was great. Thank you. Two questions for you. One is um, with ASXL1, any thoughts about how to deal with that? And the second question, and this may be uh, partly for Harry as well. So in terms of the trials and kind of the um, different uh, schema, how are, is there going to be a specific VAF cutoff or how is that going to work? So I assume when you um, ask about ASXL1, you're talking about the 646 region specifically. And um, for the audience, if you're not familiar with that, the 646 was a, was a very hot topic. Um, the reason being the 646 region has a string of eight Gs. And so it's a homopolymer region that is a particular challenge for ion torrent um, because of the hydrogen ions and um, how they come off when you do the reaction. Ion torrent basically has um, thermal fissure basically says we're not even going to try to call it, and so they took it off. Um, whereas Illumina will still try to call it, and the way Illumina works is you have to set a higher threshold. Like the true, um, the the true incidence in AML, it's only about I think five percent. In MDS, it's like fourteen percent. However, in Illumina data, at least in in our laboratory, it's like forty percent of these cases have it. Unless you set a higher threshold, I think of, of I think we set like ten percent before we actually call it, and so that's what most laboratories do, they just set a higher, you know, threshold to call. However, for this particular assay, through our validation, we just blacklisted it. We're not going to call 646. And it's one variant. Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to do that. And I don't think at this point we have an alternative method. There are PCR assays and there are Sanger sequencing assays that can detect it, um, you know, if that variant does become important in a specific clinical trial or treatment, we can do that. And so that is possible. Now that's your first question. Your second one is for your clinical trial changing and, and altering baths um, was your question. Okay, um, so we can look at that. As, as you see, there is um, there are other things that we can do um, in the assay, but it would require kind of a, a deeper look at the specific marker. And like I said, there's, for instance, the expression genes. We haven't quite looked at that yet. And we haven't worked on what those can do. The, the whole issue with the, the VAF, you know, what VAF are you going to, mm -hmm. um, very, you know, frequency are you going to allow is complicated by the fact that these marrows are being done at sites. You don't know really which sample you're getting how much hemodilution how many blasts are in there and if the mutation you're even looking at is a marker of a you know stem cell uh, like an mds clone or if it's a true marker of just the blast population like yeah I, there, there wasn't a question there was there I, you know, <laughs> I mean how are we going to deal with it yeah that's oh okay we're going to somehow that's what the matchbox is right 
Is that what the bioinformatics is going to try to deal with? Yeah. <laughs> Should we see if anyone has questions online? I just realized. Oh, yeah, I don't see any in the chat. Yes. All right. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So I think next, um, Min Feng, she online is going to yeah. be. Oh, there we go. Hi, so, Min. Hi, hi, everyone. Sorry, I can't be at Seattle. Um, uh, sorry, uh, in Chicago. I much prefer to be in Chicago because <laughs> this past week, the or the past two weeks, the terrible air quality is in um, Seattle with the uh, wildfire. Finally, the rain returned yesterday, so hopefully we'll get some relief. <laughs> yeah, and I miss seeing you guys as well. Um, can I share screen myself um, because I uh, have updated the slides? Yes. Okay. All right, so let's see. Um, please let me know if you see it in presentation mode. Yeah, I yes, can see it. Looks good. Oh, good, okay, yes. All right, thank you. So yeah, so I wanted to basically talk a little bit about the cytogenetic testing, the rapid approach, and um, some of the new technologies that we're considering as well. Um, Yes, yeah, so as you guys know that, oops, why is it not forwarding? Let's see. Okay, it is. Oh. All right. So yeah, so as you guys know, the cytogenetics karyotyping analysis remains the, uh, the gold standard for leukemia diagnosis. And um, there are many new technologies, but it still is around. And one time Fred Applebaum joked with me and said, why? I can't believe the karyotyping is still alive. <laughs> well, because it's a good old technology that's still single cell based and it actually gives you the whole genome um, diagnostic analysis. And you have the results of not only um, copy number gains and losses, but also all kinds of uh, structural rearrangements that you can visibly see. So it's, it, of course, it's low resolution that has its limitations. So it, it's been 66 years since the human chromosome numbers was nailed down to 46 in, back in 1956. And just a bit, very quick you know, timeline about some of the major technologies for clinical fish was uh, initially in, uh, implemented in 1981, although the technology was introduced in the 70s. And then um, array technologies, uh, initially was called um, comparative genome hybridization, was used um, clinically in the early 2000s, like the back CGH arrays were the first kind, but now today what's being used in the clinic are really the uh, oligo and uh, SNP arrays, SNP arrays because it gives you additional information. Um, NGS was introduced um, to clinical practice in 2008. Now, of course, it's widely used. So at Fred Hutch and UW, we introduced um, the chromosome genomic array testing, uh, which we abbreviated as CGAT, uh, clinically in 2012, it's been 10 years. Um, NGS was used clinically in 2014. And a few years ago in 2020, we also launched the RNA-based NGS testing for fusion detection, similar to the Genexus um, panel that discuss, uh, Cecilia just discussed about. So at our institution, when Brent Wood was still here, we together um, developed this called pathway testing for a, using a reflex approach that is most efficient and most effective and appropriate for a patient uh, in a timely fashion. So we'll, we've used this for many years already. So we basically have uh, morphology, flow cytometry, and uh, karyotype analysis as first tier testing. Then depending on the results, we'll reflex to necessary uh, PCR, FISH, uh, CGAT testing, and NGS. So when we started to consider the, um, the, the um, testing for Malomatch, we used similar approaches as we were doing at, the, at our institution. So here's an example of our current practice at Fred Hutch, AML rapid diagnosis, um, a diagnosis pathway strategy for acute leukemia. So if the flow and morphology indicates a my, myeloid lineage for AML diagnosis, we, um, you know, first line testing karyotype, we do a 24 to 48 hour quick turnaround time. And um, APL will be done um, 
uh, PMLRR uh, fish to exclude, um, to rule out APL. So done within 24 hours. And then the remaining, um, so testing, if karyotype is normal, then we reflex to balance fish panel along with CGAT um, testing. And then um, also some key uh, PCR testings. In recent years, we consistently have the NGS panel uh, um, automatically as well as the um, pretty much over here. Um, so, and if it's karyotype is abnormal, uh, if it is intermediate risk with, without, uh, like we will reflex to see that also and to see if there's NPCR, to see if there's additional abnormalities that might alter the risk. And um, when karyotype is abnormal, we also usually establish baseline fish to, uh, to establish an informative marker for a post-treatment MRD monitoring. So in terms of the baseline fish panel, we include the ones that are frequently seen in version three, T69 translocation, 821, in version 16, and MLL rearrangements. Um, so the malama, you've already seen this very, very many times. So for I'll just focus on the cytogenetics portion. We're gonna receive one cube of uh, heparin bone marrow uh, cube. Um, so that should be sufficient for all our testing. What we uh, plan to do is uh, karyotype will be performed on all samples. And here we wanted to do the, in order to meet the turnaround time of 72 hours for even the, all the markers. So, so we were gonna do standard fish panel upfront. Um, that would include the standard fish panel includes these six, uh, basically the balanced translocations shown here I mentioned as well. And, um, and together with CGAT, this, this would be our majority of the sample with su sufficient material. In case there is not sufficient material for CGAT or for whatever reason we cannot do CGAT, we will do an expanded fish panel. Um, then that would include all 15 um, fish, extended fish panel is 15 probe set. So seven probe set for a balanced rearrangement. And um, then with the addition of, you know, the common myeloid probes, Comes on 5, 7, 8, 20, uh, and uh, with TP53, ETV6, that's the 12P, and RUNCS1, NUP96, uh, 98. These are the ones that are known to have poor prognosis. So then, now, as you guys uh, know, the ELN 2022 just came out, and there's this new um, prognostic um, marker that's uh, included in the table but this is really very rarely seen. Um, so we do not have a probe set for it. So if a um, model match uh, committee decides that we wanted to go by the ELL 2022, then we're gonna need to add this probe for validation and uh, implementation. But that is still to be determined by the model match steering committee. So in terms of the workflow um, for our lab, how to achieve that 72 hour turnaround time. So I would draw your attention to the center panel first because karyotype is really the first and foremost, the important um, testing. So we have tissue culture, we will do, um, oops. Typically we need the karyotype analysis to be obtained from at least two cultures, two different cultures. Uh, so we will do overnight um, culture of 24, hour, basically 24 hour cultures of two different types with and without supplements. Um, and then we have a uh, 48 couch, hour culture also used as a backup. Then on the day two, we'll be able to harvest those slides and prep for metaphase check. Uh, and if for, from these two cultures of the 24 hour cultures, if we have sufficient metaphase for analysis, we'll be able to complete the analysis on day, day two. And, or if there's any leftover for cases that are complex, um, day three will require it for analysis as well. Um, then we'd be able to complete the study. And in case there's insufficient metaphases from the overnight two cultures, um, then we'll go resort to the 48 hour culture and to, in order to complete the study. So that then um, from the fish side, so we will basically do immediate um, before culture, uncultured sample make slides um, to hybridize overnight. And so on the next day, we'll be able to, if 
the quality is good, we'll be able to proceed with analysis and complete a report on day three. And if the quality is not good, we will resort to um, hybridization on cultured specimens you know, from the karyotype analysis and be able to finish the study on day three as well. So that's how we can finish um, these studies within 72 hours. CGAT workflow is different. Um, so it, the workflow itself, it does take uh, five days. And then uh, uh, in terms of, you know, depending on how, when the sample arrives at the lab, and we usually also need to batch. So the, um, the run is done, uh, if it's once a week, it'll take uh, five to 10 business days to finish that. But now we have already redesigned the workflow to do two runs per week. Um, and we're able to shorten the turnaround time uh, to, you know, if it's perfect, perfect thing, it'll be like four to five days. Um, or um, if it's not, the timing is bad, then it'll go, still go to, go to um, eight to nine days in order to finish. On the other hand, the key uh, risk stratification tool is really based on karyotype and fish results. Um, CGAT will be a nice addition. Um, also, uh, another important point to make is that um, for AML, myeloid um, malignancies, really the karyotype can see, can detect pretty much everything. Fish, most of the time, will be uh, very consistent with karyotype. We actually see the value of karyotype being more than fish, in fact. Um, there's publication for that. So um, here I wanted to show you the 2022 year-long risk classification. Um, so you guys have already seen it and I wanted to overlay the 2017 uh, stratification to, to, see, to show you the difference, especially um, related to the cytogenetics aspect. So certainly the favorable part remains very much the same except the mutation aspect. Um, for the um, intermediate risk, Part, we already know the T911 uh, translocation is one exception for MLL or KMT2A rearrangement that is not high risk. It is actually intermediate risk. Um, this is consistent um, in 2020, but the new guideline uh, made a clarification that if, oops, if there is co-occurrence of mutations like the this panel down here that are of poor risk, it does not overwrite the 911 uh, risk. So what I'm saying is, if it is into oops, well, sorry, this is very finicky. Um, so if there's intermediate risk for um, the the 911, and you also have concurrent mutations in this panel, it'll still be intermediate risk. So that's uh, the clarification. Then the other uh, important um, changes that would, had happened was here in um, this inversion three or three three translocation that was in 2017. This is still the same, um, but it also clarified that um, the if there's any three Q two six point two rearrangement, the MECOM and EDI one rearranged region. Um, so there because there are translocations of this this with other chromosomes, that's also considered as adverse risk. This is one thing, you know, there are a lot of discussions previously and Meg and I were also thinking about using SWOC data to show this should be also listed. So I'm glad they actually did include it this time. And another clarification is about the complex karyotype and monosomal karyotype. So clarification about complex karyotype, um, it's, we know it's greater than three or at least three uh, numerical or structural abnormalities. So, but there are some karyotypes that are just hyperdeployed uh, with only numerical changes and not structural changes. And these were actually, they were previously labeled as complex, but not, but they're actually not associated with uh, adverse uh, risk. So that got clarified, the new, classification tool says, if you see uh, only numerical changes, and if it's redundant, that doesn't count as two, like some of the carrier price, say plus eight, plus eight, plus 13, that seems like three carrier type, uh, abnormalities, but it's not of adverse uh, risk. So uh, if 
purely hyperdeployed carrier type without structural abnormalities are no longer considered complex carrier type. Yeah, and um, a monosomal carrier type is still there. And um, so the mutations, as you know, got expanded. And um, about the RUNX1, so you, you can see the RUNX1 and uh, ASX01 and TP53 um, was there before. So we are, um, of course, the abnormal uh, 17P has always been there. So any rearrangement of um, 17P would be considered abnormal. So we don't, uh, that's the reason that we, we might be uh, including the fish TP53 in our panel that is due to be delivered. Um, worked out and to be considered. We have a probe for it. Um, it can detect some um, deletions that are of small size than what you normally see from karyotype. So yeah, that's a consideration. So this actually, the revised um, 2022 ELL risk classification guideline, now for at least for the cytogenetics part, actually goes back to consistent with what we wrote um, previously, what I wrote for the S1203, um, the, the, the poor risk cytogenetics criteria. So um, the revised version is better. So we um, very consistent with what we had, um, with the only exception that deletion 7Q still somehow is not included as an adverse uh, risk factor, which we could still, Megan and I can still work on um, to clarify that aspect. Um, so actually I asked uh, Clara Bloomfield in 2018, you know, after, um, the, after the ELL in 2017 was out and um, she said she didn't know why deletion 7Q was left out. And so we were at the time thinking about looking at both of the, uh, their cohort and our cohort to um, dive deeper, but, uh, but unfortunately she um, left us, yeah. So, um, oh, another thing, I just wanted to quickly show you a few slides why we included um, SIGA testing in this approach, because we do see it actually has value to detect many um, abnormalities, sub-microscopic deletions and gains, and also copy neutral loss factors at Gossity that is of prognostic significance. Although they're not currently included in these risk stratification tools, but we have used this in our uh, institution for a decade and really see the significant value of it. Um, so like sub -micro smaller deletions that you won't be able to see otherwise. Um, and um, some of the uh, subtle cryptic uh, rearrangements, you uh, could be hinted by array testing and then this could be subsequently um, confirmed as a fusion. Of course, now with Genexus, I, I, I think this, this fusion will be picked up routinely now. Um, so we actually uh, published back in 2015 that uh, about the prognostic take significance of acquired copy neutral loss of heterozygosity in AML using our own Fred Hutch data. And then later, uh, uh, European group also published in Leukemia in 2017 about the value of copy number um, aberration identified by array analysis. And so from our own institution, what we uh, saw, uh, showed was that um, the presence of copy neutral loss of heterozygosity really contributes to um, work, a more relapse and um, poor overall survival. And especially in the case of 13Q, copy neutral loss of heterozygosity, which is associated with um, homozygous Fleet 3 ITD mutation, um, will significantly uh, increase relapse uh, risk and decrease overall survival. Um, so that CNLOH in general, and in particular, the 13Q CNLOH. So as you can see, the change of the yellow um, criteria from 2017 to 2022, um, the, the one criteria that they took out, sorry, I'm just gonna move back a little bit, was the, uh, the, the you know, FLEE 3 ITD low. Um, it's no longer mentioned low versus high. So actually, it's not a matter of the allele frequency low and high. High. What we noticed was really it's a matter of whether it's associated with copy neutral loss of heterozygosity. That's that that is uh, matters. Yeah, because it's the homozygous status of the free three rather than the um, specific that variant allele frequency. So, 
sorry, let me go back. So yeah, and then there's a comprehensive uh, um, evidence-based array, uh, evidence-based review by the Cancer Genomics Consortium um, and to really talk about the clinical utility of copy number abnormality and copy neutral loss of viscosity in AML. Um, we also, um, years ago, Megan and I also performed analysis using the SWOG uh, AML samples with normal cytogenetics. Um, I'm, I'm yet to write up that paper. <laughs> um, and so we uh, have sh shown, the analysis ha ha has really shown very nicely that relapse-free survival was worse in patients with abnormal CGAT compared with the normal group an increasing number of um, CGAT aberrations, so the genomic lesions and the genomic complexity were associated with uh, worse relax-free survival on both univariate and multivariate analysis. Um, CNLH was also shown to uh, associate with the relax-free survival um, and uh, overall survival, just real quick. Um, and then, you know, genomic complexity by CGAT was associated with decreased chance of complete remission as well. So we looked at these um, values. Um, yeah. um, so now I also wanted to mention a little bit um, another new technology. So because the CGAT testing is really great, but it's the limitation is that it does not detect balanced translocations. So in, um, AML, there are many critical uh, balanced translocations that are prognostically significant. And so there recently there's this new cool technology called optical genomic mapping um, that is it has really uh, transformed the way we detect structural abnormality in a much more sensitive manner. It's also able to pick up um, copy number aberrations, but it does not detect CNLH. So these new technologies each has their own limitations. So this technology combines the nanochannel array with optical mapping to image extremely long high molecular weight on DNA. It's like greater than 200,000 um, KB in length of intact DNA um, and to detect that in its most native form. And um, so it detects the structural variants. Um, so just to show you two examples. One is a BLL patient that's pH negative and um, you can easily detect very small um, ICROS-1 deletion, that's critical, and uh, pH-like um, signatures of the, the FAX5 ZCCH7 um, fusion, you know, by there's a deletion uh, leading to a fusion. And then you can also um, identify the signature pH-like uh, fusion on X chromosome of by fusing the CRLF2 and uh, P2RY8 gene. So this is a new technology that our lab is currently validating. Um, and so actually this is study you know, that I actually, I think it'll be very promising to, we have our uh, SWOG BLL uh, data set that's pH negative. I talked to Angela, uh, uh, Angeline, Angeli, sorry, um, before about um, confirming, cause we did, we had um, pH, uh, like BLL uh, samples were tested using the gene expression profiling to um, determine those gene signatures. Uh, this is an alternative way to really confirm the type of uh, specific rearrangements that you see in those pH like uh, ALLs. So back to the AML samples, um, here's an example of an AML patient with favorable a diagnosis of favor favorable risk, um, and it's the inversion 16. By karyotype, we were also able to see a 1622 uh, translocation um, using the uh, by the, the this um, optical genomic mapping methods. We we actually saw not only um, these two um, mutation uh, translocations and rearrangements very clearly. We also saw there was a deletion associated in the derivative um, uh, chromosome, on the derivative chromosome 22 with the 16P sequence. So this, um, and it, it identifies very clearly about specific translocations you know, associated with the 1622 translocation. It's actually leading to the STX1B and uh, GTPBP1 um, rearrangement and fusion. 
Um, so with this deletion, it becomes a uh, look like three uh, genome uh, abnormalities instead of the original two. Although this does not, at least you know, according to current uh, risk criteria, it does not change the favorable uh, prognostic feature. Okay, so with that, I just wanted to um, thank all the members of the Fred Hutch and UW, UW Cytogenetics team. And um, I have so many wonderful colleagues at both Fred Hutch and SWOG that uh, I have learned so much from over the years. And I'm really glad this time I'm able to uh, join uh, Jerry and Cecilia for working on the model match study. Okay, any questions? Thank you very much. Um, Laura, I know you have a question. I'll have you unmute in a second. I have a question, though, first for um, for Min. Mm -hmm. You know, Sorry. Yeah. what I thought um, took so much time in cytogenetic analysis is the analysis that you have to do. I mean, you have an overnight culture. You drop the cells on a slide. You fix them. You stain them. Um, and then it's then it's you. Then it's you yeah. looking at them. So my question is. In, in the SWOG study, where we're expecting many of the patients who qualify for poor risk to have complex structural changes, are you really going to read out all of those complex structural changes, or are you just going to say, this is a complex karyotype in, in 72 hours? We are going to read out all the complex changes. So it's, a, it's, it's all about staffing. So one uh, like critical feature, uh, critical like resource that we need is proper staffing uh, when we talk about rapid cytogenetic testing. Yeah, so we have, uh, you know, mapped out the staffing needs and we will, of course, we prioritize our different types of testing. When there is the myelomatch study or in our own institution, like I mentioned, we already do rapid cytogenetic testing for leukemia uh, patients. So we do um, get those out there. Majority of the ML diagnostic samples, you know, are not that complex. But there, when there are times when it's extremely, extremely complex, we'll be able to um, at least give the risk assignment at seventy-two hours, the preliminary one. Um, but I, but the goal is to get even the complex carrier type completed by seventy-two hour. Okay. My second question is, you know, myelomatch is going to include uh, myelodysplastic syndrome. And recently, um, Ellie Papa Manuel has um, published uh, data looking at uh, important, cyto uh, important uh, mutations in that classification. And one of them um, that's not in the AML risk stratification is MLL or KMT2A partial tandem duplications. Yes. So yes. are we going to include those? Well, so that's so that's something that'll be detectable by CGAT. So we will have the data, but currently it's not in the uh, ELL um, class risk stratification to either the 2017 or 2022 criteria. So whether we want to include that as a risk factor for myelomatch study, that is to be determined. Yeah, we can talk about it. I think, but at least we have the data, we'll be able to correlate, we'll be able to see. But whether it's going to be used as upfront risk um, assignment, that has to be determined. Because not only that, but also, you know, I mentioned about we plan to include the NUP98, um, uh, the, the rearrangement. Although it's well known to be a poor risk cytogenetics factor, but it's not in those. Uh, Yellow criteria. So as of now, the steering committee says we're going to use just the yellow criteria for risk assignment. So there is also the RUNX1 gene mutation is considered as poor risk factor by those uh, criteria, um, same as TP53. But what about rearrangement? You know, TP53, of course, the abnormal 17P rearrangement will be considered poor. But RUNX1, what about rearrangement? What about big deletions? Are they considering, uh, yeah, are we considering them? So I would say yes, um, but strictly according to um, yellow risk stratification, it 
does not necessarily um, belong to the adverse group. Okay. Laura, did you want to unmute? I know you have a question. Yeah, I actually had two questions. And Min, what you were talking about actually provoked these questions, but it may be something that I want to ask Jerry and um, Cecilia. And that's the first question is, I've only recently become aware that there's different uh, impacts of different kinds of p53 mutations like as I understand it maybe this loss of function mutation has a different clinical impact than a gain of function mutation and I wondered if our molecular testing would be able to discern between those that level and the second question for Jerry and Celia is whether or not we're going to flag for our researchers or for our clinicians when potential germline mutations are picked up that should maybe spark a question of a germline investigation. Would that be part of our MRSRP notification protocols at all? So I can um, answer this briefly first and I'll let um, Jerry and Edna and Cecilia uh, dive into it further. So for the testing, um, the type of TP53 abnormalities, the, uh, depending on the domain of the gene itself. And there is a very good database that you can refer to to look at different um, abnormalities. So there are classifications of pathogenic, likely pathogenic, and et cetera. So these, I think the, it'll be um, included in the report that I'll let um, Cecilia dive deeper into that. Um, and germline testing actually for like CGAT testing or karyotype analysis, we will pick up germline abnormalities that's been known for decades. And um, so there are ways to differentiate those. And um, so how to use that, that's really a different thing, right? It's a, a depending on oncologists, you know, whether they wanted to use that information for uh, change practice or family consultation, et cetera, that's a different one. Yeah, so, um... The current Genexus program actually does for TP53 tell you, uh, you know, it the way the software actually works is it will highlight whether it is a loss of function or a gain of function mutation, in addition to telling you whether it may be a VUS, et cetera. But of course, we always verify that with the various databases that Min is uh, mentioning. And so I do have my clinical variant scientists um, dive deeper. And then the um, answering your question about germline versus not germline. So we do look at whether um, germline versus somatic calls. And what helps us here is two things. And it gets a little bit more detail and a little bit more, nu more nuanced. So what we rely on here is the VAF, right, the variant Leo frequency, and if it gets around 50% in a patient who has um, pure leukemic blast population, it's really difficult for us to tell. However, if you tell me that the sample has a 20% blast mm -hmm. and I'm seeing a 50% VAF on a TP53 mutation, then I'm going to say, okay, this potentially could be a germline, but you, you need to confirm that with, say, a buccal swab or a skin biopsy or something along those lines to confirm the germline mutation. And so you might see a comment from me um, asking for those types of follow-up germline testing. And um, following up to what Min says, there for the TP53 germline mutations, there is also databases that have confirmed these types of mutations. And so we do see it on our end. And so those are things that you might see in the comment section um, of our reports. Does that answer your question? It absolutely does. It makes me think also about the fact that as MyloMatch may want to, we may want to have a bunch of people on call uh, as cons, cons, consultants for the various investigators enrolling patients to maybe be able to call and ask some questions or something like that, similar to what ECOG did with patients who were diagnosed with APL and a way to kind of phone a friend when you really need somebody to weigh in because you know these, as we learn more and more and these technologies are amazing, it seems like we may need some help with um, making sure that the people using it understand the nuances of the um, of the of the testing. I would like to say that um, at least at the Hutch, uh, my oncologists they know my numbers and they contact me frequently. And <laughs> and the uh, other thing is um, there will be a molecular tumor boards of sorts, and I think that is already in um, effect at the NCI. Oh. 
Great. Well, thank you, Min Feng. Absolutely. I am. Oh, Laura. Okay, Laura, you're up. <laughs> okay, great. I'm just going to share my screen. Are you guys seeing presenter mode? Um, not yet. Okay, hold on. Now it is. Now? And you're seeing the right version, right? Okay. Um, all right, well, thank you, everybody. Um, you know, you, I'm sure everybody's gonna be sick of hearing about Myla Match, but um, because it's such a large project and because there's so many uh, um, sort of categories of it. Um, that's why we're spending some time on it here. My job is to give a little bit of an overview of where we stand with the studies that have been introduced to date. And then um, we're going to have Tara Lynn and Paul and Eric talk about initially the high risk AML study. And then Eric's going up to update where we are on the IDH2 mutated study. Um, and um, so as you know, um, and you've seen these graphs before, the MyloMatch is a way to basically systematically coordinate a um, platform of trials so that in an ideal world, we're doing really standard setting clinical investigations in a coordinated way. Some of the words that you've heard include things like Milo, this master screening protocol, which is the MSRP, that where, um, so when you hear that, uh, that phrase, that's what this is, and that's the way that people will enter the studies. And then you've heard something about baskets, and we have four different baskets, so MDS basket, older patient basket, younger or AYA patient basket, and a transplant basket. So within those baskets, trials are being developed. And then you've also heard the word tier, and the tier is, is a way to reference where the patient is on the long-term road of treatment. Are they newly diagnosed? Are they treated and MRD positive? Are they entering some form of consolidation, maybe transplant? Or are they in a remission and we're looking at methods of disease control? And so, you can sort of imagine lines being drawn between each of the baskets in each of these tiers, and it could become a spaghetti uh, situation pretty quickly. But again, the idea is that each patient could enter within a basket and then move through the tiers in a relatively coordinated way with the results of their earlier trials and uh, also the results of their earlier genetic testing informing what happens on the subsequent tiers. Initially, we were anticipating that all patients had to enter MyLaMatch through a front door. And that front door was defined by a single basket and being newly diagnosed. However, we are exploring whether or not patients who may have been treated elsewhere on a non match study for their newly diagnosed leukemia, but are found to be MRD positive, for example, whether or not they could enter on subsequent tiers. Given the priority to um, making sure that this is a nimble and that accrual is, um, early accrual is maximized, uh, the senior leadership for match is definitely leaning towards at this point, allowing patients to move <laughs> in at any given tier. And that uh, is something that will help us when we're when the FDA is working on the IND for this project. So again, you've seen this and you can sort of understand then this, this sort of, do they fall initially under this treatment protocol or this treatment protocol? And once they go through this treatment protocol, do they get to another one? So these types of cartoons are used to just try and describe where we are. So what are the overall aims? Um, we wanna set the standard of care for individuals with AML and MDS, as you know, our current way that we do trials is very competitive and not necessarily organized. And that's because it's a marketplace. And the people that 
have the novel agents are, you know, shop for places to open those. And it's not necessarily in a coordinated fashion or in a systematic fashion. And we think that the cooperative groups and the NCTN can, can change that by, um, and therefore be better at setting a true standard of care um, rather than a set of options um, and can do that in this coordinated way. Of course, we want to capitalize on the promise of targeted therapies, things that have been kind of come out of the of the lab in the last 20 years. Um, and we want to know, are they really just, are they really the determinative way that we're going to cure these diseases? Or are they um, something that should be added to our otherwise no, known therapies? We want to validate and expand the role of flight, flow cytometrics and measure, um, base measurable residual disease. We want to validate laboratory assays to assess, assess prognosis and response. And a key part of that is to also validate clinical assays like geriatric assessments and quality of life measures, which we're moving forward to layer on top of all the trials as well. And then finally, provide an opportunity for investigators through the cooperative groups to participate and lead national clinical leukemia research. So um, the studies that come, the studies begin in the basket working groups. Um, so an investigator who's interested in, in a study should determine, is this a study that I wanna test in younger patients, older patients? Is this a transplant study or an MDS study? And then by joining those working groups, you vet a trial concept, we talk it out. And then once it's relatively solidified concept, then we present it to the Senior Scientific Council. And what I should have is some arrows here because these back and forths from the basket groups to the Scientific Council can happen multiple times. But during that time period, the Senior Scientific Council is also working out appropriate pharmaceutical partnerships that could um, allow for the use of agents in those studies. So that relationship with a given pharmaceutical partner doesn't happen at the investigator end. Um, those are really, does happen at the CTEP end. Um, once that is determined and that concept sort of reaches approval, then we have a coordinating meeting. We just had one recently looking at a menin inhibitor and we therefore align the study with the pharmaceutical plan and also the guidelines for the FDA. In some cases, we want the study to be registrational. So we wanna make sure that all of those are aligned as the um, study then gets presented to the cooperative groups, subsequently submitted to the leuke leukemia steering committee. And then as studies traditionally have, the protocol gets written and it moves towards activation on a relatively tight timeline. Now, this is only what, seven, nine, whatever bullets, but within each of these, there's a ton of bullets that, um, and lots of dashboards where we are. And you saw an example of that, for example, when um, with um, Jerry's presentation. So what are the benefits of participating in Myelomatch? So we think there's benefits on many ways. There's benefits to the individual patient where they have novel therapies, access to novel therapies that are chosen on the basis of their particular tumor. And that there's this coordinated care trajectory that um, allows them to be really treated with the best possible standards of care all the way across their disease. And also have, as I mentioned, their subsequent care informed by their prior care. There's benefits to the enrolling sites because people can have a menu of possible trials um, so that when you get a new patient, you can say, look, no matter what kind of AML you have, we have some good options for you. We have the best possible options for you. And there's also benefits of being in, you know, in a central IRB, central contracting type of relationship like we do with the, BM, with the, um, uh, NC, uh, the NCTN groups. And there's benefits to the pharma partners. And one of the most important is that for long periods of time, novel agents have been really available only in larger centers or designated cancer centers in a really, um, and the patients have been asked to go to where the trials are. Um, by doing this in such a wide, in such a wide way with distribution through all the, NC, all the NCTN sites, we're gonna allow the trials to come to the patients. 
And that's pretty consistent with the way we need to start thinking about um, treating patients uh, with diseases like this. So um, where are we? In the younger patient group, um, we have the following seven studies have been proposed and some are a little bit farther on than others. Um, this one here, I have two here. I duplicated a, a row apparently, but the greens are the ones that have been approved by the Leukemia Steering Committee. We're gonna hear in a second about the high risk protocol, which is MM1YA SO1. This is a SWOG protocol. There is a intermediate risk protocol that's also been approved by the um, Leukemia Steering Committee that's being led by the Canadian Cancer Trials Group. And then one that's being led by uh, the SWA or the ECOG group will be for patients who go through initial induction, uh, cytotoxic induction, and still have measurable residual disease, who would then go through this, what's called a RACE study to try and get them into an MRD negative state by the time that they go to transplant, for example. We have a number of studies that have been proposed through the older patient working group. Um, the ones that are farthest along are one, the um, SO2, MM1OA, which is uh, for P53 mutated uh, disease. This was approved by the Leukemia Steering Committee. So it has a um, kind of absolute activation date that's been set and is now moving through the contracting and approval process. And one for FLT3 mutated disease that's also been approved by the Leukemia Steering Committee. I would uh, estimate that the earlier studies will be those in younger patients, and these would then be the next wave. We are also looking at studies, and we're gonna talk about, for example, this study for an IDH2 mutant disease. We have a study for a menin inhibitor in NPM1 mutated disease. We're really looking for concepts if people are interested and have any ideas for patients who have no known marker uh, or at least targetable marker or those who are refractory to hypomethylating agents. In the MDS basket, the farthest along is one for TP53 mutated MDS. Um, and they're also looking for those who have um, wild type P53 has been proposed. And then we recently discussed one for low risk MDS using small molecule inhibitors with um, a reduction of anemia as the uh, typical outcome. We've got the protocols per basket. We sort of keep track of these um, and how many are there and where they are in the, the status of things. And then also the numbers through NCTN group, which I also think is great. So not even though these might be led by a given investigator from that group, each of the protocols has a panel of investigators, of young investigators working on it, people who are shepherding the protocols through and may not be in the same group as the lead group. The lead group is really where the data will be housed more than anything and also the role of the statistician. So I wanna turn it over now to, I think Tara is gonna present. And Tara, I have your slides, so just wanna let me know that uh, I should advance, I'll go ahead. Yeah, great, thank you, Laura. Um, thanks everybody. Um, I'm just gonna talk for a couple of minutes about this um, high risk uh, trial that we have um, for younger patients. And I wanna thank our collaborators, three SWOG, Anna and Megan, and then Paul Shammy is also um, a study chair and on the call today. Next slide. Um, so I think it's important to go over the objectives when we think about this giant study um, that this protocol is going to be a part of. The primary objective of this protocol is going to be to look at the rates of MRD negative complete remission between each of the experimental arms and then the backbone, kind of the standard arm, which is the seven and three. The secondary objectives are to look at the toxicities with the regimens and then to look at response rates that are less than an MRD negative CR, and then to look at survival, event-free survival, relapse-free survival, uh, and overall survival. Um, later on, you know, we'll be able to look at the MRD negative CR rates um, by genomic subgroups um, across all of the different arms. And then with all of the, the trials that are part of this project, right, the biobanking um, is a real critical piece. Next slide. 
So the inclusion criteria and thinking about this as being a study that we really wanna have broadly open, um, we tried to have the inclusion exclusion criteria be as generous as possible. Um, so for this study, it's gonna be um, newly diagnosed uh, high risk patients. And again, like we talked about earlier, you know, the protocol was written based on the ELN 2017 criteria. Um, it's important to note that treatment related AML or AML coming out of um, a prior MDS or MPN um, is going to be allowed, um, but FLT3 and uh, 922 are going to be excluded. Um, prior anthracycline is allowed. Um, obviously, you know, we tried to be generous with the hepatic and renal function, but we also needed to keep it, um, uh, keep it consistent across all of the protocols that are in the younger patient baskets. Next slide, please. Um, I'm looking at these for the for the the key features, you know. So Wilson's disease is going to be an exclusion because this protocol does have CPX three fifty one um, in in at least one of the arms. Um, HIV and hepatitis um, are going to be allowed uh, if they're under control. Next slide. And so this is not as pretty a version <laughs> as the one that Laura showed of how the process is going to work, right? So patients are going to come in and enter through the MSRP. And then when they're found to have a high risk disease, then they're going to be enrolled onto this MM1YA SO1 trial. And then after induction, which will vary a little bit, um, you know, the cycles and timing by each of the arms, um, then patients will go on to the MSRP reassessment and then possibly on to another tier protocol, depending on uh, their remission status and MRD results. Next slide. So these are the arms. So again, this is high-risk AML uh, for younger patients. And the randomization is going to be one-to-one-to-one-to-one, to one to one to one, although I will tell you there is discussion of adding um, another arm before the trial even gets fully off the ground. Um, so what we're looking at is a backbone, you know, a kind of our standard of care comparator arm is seven and three. And then the three investigational arms are seven and three plus venetoclax, which is given on days one to 11, um, videza venetoclax, where the venetoclax is given 28 days because that is the label indication. And then CPX 351, given it its standard doses on days one, three, and five. Next slide. Um, so again, you know, the randomization is gonna be even across the arms. Um, there will be a stratification by age. The, the very young versus the not quite as young, 18 to 39 versus 40 to 59, uh, as well as by TP53 mutation status. Um, as of right now with four arms, we're looking at up to 268 patients. Um, when we look at the statistics of trying to track an improvement in the MRD negative CR rate, um, we use the baseline rate um, based on the MRD negative CR rate in high risk patients that we saw on the SWOG 0106 protocol. Um, toxicity, where you should have plenty of patients to take a look at that. Um, the final analysis is designed to just look at um, the MRD negative CR rates um, in the experimental arms uh, and then compared to the seven and three arm. Next slide. I think that was all yours, Tara. I think so too, great, thank you. Tara, I did have a quick question and that's um, about the uh, eligibility, did you consider having um, individual eligibility for each of the different arms, which for example, if somebody had Wilson's disease, they might be eligible for any arm except the one with CPX. And I know that was something that we allowed in 1612, but I just don't know if that was, if the way that this the statistics are in this, that you couldn't have eligibility that differed per arm. We, there were definitely conversations and this is where we landed. And I will be honest, right? I can't speak to the specifics of all the, the sure. no, of course. that went into that. We talked about it, right? Because there was also, a, so there was the question of the Wilson's disease mm -hmm. and then a question of, you know, for patients on venetoclax, how their azol requirements would have to mm -hmm. be different. And, you know, the decision was made to just keep the eligibility criteria the same for everybody across Got the it. Board. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It definitely, it was, it definitely came up and there was a lot of discussion. <laughs> and then the only other question I had is how quick did we enroll to 1203? And did that, um, what's the, what's the accrual um, estimation? So example for per month for this study. 
I don't know. I don't know that information. I'm not sure if Paul knows or if somebody else on the Maybe call. Megan. I think um, Megan's yeah. in the audience. Do you remember? <clears throat> yeah, Megan, Megan would, just left. Um, oh, yeah. okay, sorry. My my guess, if I recall, me, I mean, Megan had estimated that based on uh, prior study. I think the target was about ten patients per month. But got it. I think that sounds right. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, Tara, thank you very much for that. Um, we'll, maybe uh, we'll stick around. There may be questions at the end of this. We want to. I'll move on so Eric will have a chance to. So just to again put this in context, this is. The um, purple one here is what we just heard about. This is um, approved and moving through uh, to be one of the first ones open. Additionally approved is the one I mentioned, uh, which is non-high risk, or um, this is the one that's been approved and moving through and is sponsored by the Canadian Cancer Trials Group. And then finally, this ECOG study for people, which will be in um, the tier two, as we discussed. So next, I want to ask Eric if he'll uh, give an update about the SWOG study for IDH2 mutated AML. Uh, yes, thank you. So again, this is the IDH2 mutant trial for the older adult uh, unfit uh, clinical basket here. And, and this is a randomized phase two trial of the oral decitabine compound uh, with cetazurazine with venetoclax and enocytinib um, compared to standard therapy with azacitidine and venetoclax for newly diagnosed older adults with IDH2 mutant AML. Next slide, please. So venetoclax and hypomethylating agents are standard of care for older patients with AML. We know that IDH2 mutant subgroup have higher overall response rates and improved overall survival with venetoclax and hypomethylating agents. However, most of these patients will have persistent minimal residual disease and detectable variant allele frequencies of IDH2 despite these good responses. We know that BCL2 inhibition and IDH inhibitors have good preclinical and limited clinical synergy, and the triplet combinations looking at venetoclax, hypomethylating agents, and IDH inhibitors in the IDH1 mutant group have uh, very high overall response rates, including high rates of MRD negative responses. So we hypothesize that adding IDH2 inhibition to a uh, backbone of HMA and venetoclax could improve rates of MRD negative remissions. Next slide, please. So this is our trial schema showing um, this a randomized phase two trial um, of CDEC, the oral decitabine compound, and anaclax and anacitinib compared to standard therapy. Uh, these patients would be newly diagnosed through the MSRP protocol, be over the age of 60 and considered unfit for standard therapy. They would be randomized one-to-one -to, -one to standard azacitidine and venetoclax or this novel all-oral triplet regimen of CDEC, venetoclax, and metacitin. Patients would receive two 28-day cycles and be assessed for response um, with marrow biopsy, um, with primary endpoint being a rate of minimal residual disease negative remission as measured by flow cytometry. Patients driving clinical benefit would uh, continue until disease progression, unacceptable toxicity, or um, decision to proceed with allogeneic transplant. Um, at which time they'd be taken off trial and uh, may be eligible for subsequent tiers of myelomash protocols. Next slide, please. Again, the primary objective is the rate of MRD negative uh, composite complete remissions after two cycles of combination therapy. Um, our major secondary endpoints are looking at relapse-free survival, event-free survival, duration of response, and overall survival by treatment arm. We plan on uh, measuring IDH2 mutant variant allele frequency as well as MRD uh, with flow cytometry and molecular methods in the bone marrow um, and peripheral blood at defined time points um, through the MSRP protocol. Um, we'll also evaluate uh, clinical responses and, and how these correlate with, uh, with MRD negativity. Next slide, please. Uh, inclusion criteria will be um, largely shared throughout uh, other trials in this uh, uh, clinical basket. Uh, patients will be assigned to this trial through the MSRP protocol um, and have the presence of an IDH2 mutation. Uh, patients will be over the age of 60 and uh, will be considered unfit for intensive chemotherapy, either by um, meeting published criteria or just uh, in the basis of the investigator's assessment. Um, patients with a history of prior treatment for an antecedent hematologic disorder, um, except for the supportive measures listed below, would be ineligible. 
and uh, patients would uh, meet parameters for having adequate organ function, um, which would be shared between trials. Next slide, please. Our null hypothesis is that the rate of uh, flow cytometry, uh, minimal residual disease negativity with standard azocytidine venetic clax is about 40% based on the VLA study. And we hypothesize this triplet regimen would improve uh, MRD negative responses to about 65%. Uh, we will require about 88 patients randomized one-to-one -to, -one, uh, to give an 83% power with two-sided alpha of 20% in this phase two trial and plan on performing interim analysis after 44 patients. Um, as far as accrual, based on um, prior trials, um, including uh, older unfit patients, um, we anticipate accruing about three patients per month, um, meaning we can fully accrue this trial in two and a half years, um, which we feel is a conservative estimate. So this trial was approved by the Milo Match Senior Scientific Council, as well as the SWAG Executive Committee, and is currently awaiting uh, logistical and financial feasibility review. That's great, Eric, thank you so much. Um, so I just have a couple more slides and then we'll do questions or do you wanna do questions now, Harry? No, that's great, yeah. great work, really wonderful work, Eric and Laura and so, Sarah and Paul. So this just fits in just a couple slides here. This fits into the older patient group. This is our older patient plan where we do have studies for P53, IDH2, and then Uma Barate and, um, and uh, John Reagan are looking into uh, doing a similar study for IDH1 mutable. Um, we do need help if anybody's got ideas for a targetable, non, non, no targetable marker, uh, HMA refractory patients or patients who need salvage therapy. So those are still open questions, as well as uh, if people have a target that we haven't thought about yet. As I mentioned, we do have a menin inhibitor trial that's not in this graph. So uh, I just wanted to issue an invitation. If you're interested in joining our work, any of the working group baskets, if you have an idea for a study, please email me um, because we are always looking for um, new ideas. And uh, this, is, this is big. Uh, it takes a long time to get this happening, but once it does, it'll provide, I really truly believe it will provide a structure by which we can, um, in a very definitive way, help the patients that are diagnosed with acute leukemia and myelodysplastic syndrome in uh, North America. So thank you. Thanks, Laura, that was great. Um, you know, a lot of what we've organized in MyeloMatch came from the blood, sweat and tears of Laura Michaels in SWOG 1612. Um, we learned a lot of lessons there, but it, it was a very similar kind of idea where we were going to have true intergroup collaborations in developing clinical trials for our patients with uh, leukemia. So we learned a lot of lessons on, on the back of Laura, unfortunately, um, but important lessons for how to, how to build this. And uh, uh, Laura has been uh, instrumental um, in this uh, process and in leading the older uh, adult AML working group. And uh, thanks, Laura, for your leadership here. Uh, we've come a long way. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. So I think uh, we really appreciate everyone's wonderful talks and uh, I think we're adjourned unless anyone else has any questions. This is Gail, can I say a quick word? Yes, absolutely. Um, as, your pa as a patient advocate for both the leukemia and the myelomatch committees, it's really, oh God, I didn't think I'd be this close this morning. Um, it's really just been such a pleasure to work to work with everybody. And I just want to say on behalf of patients and families, thank you so much. It's really, um, I think Laura's last comment just really wrapped it up. So um, on behalf of all patients and families um, in North America right now, thank you so much. That's it. Thank you, Gail. Gail, Gail um, has been uh, with the project from early on. She accepted the invitation to be patient advocate. And then as, as the whole thing grew, uh, we realized that we needed even more help from our advocates. And so I, we've added uh, four more uh, members. So thanks for what you're doing to help this. Thank you. Okay, well, I guess we're adjourned. Safe travels back.